Hello, and welcome to the Paul Cardall Podcast. You're looking good. How are you, Paul? You haven't aged at all. Well, no, we are all aging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're, you're able to do this and to talk about your projects. And um, so I want to, we're going to start, but I, I want everybody to know how much I love my guest, Kenneth Cope, and the impact, Kenneth, you've had on me mm. as a writer, though our music is completely different. And I've always, and I hope this is a compliment, but for me, you know, you have the, the commercial LDS music culture, and then you have kind of this gospel music association, CCM culture. Right. And growing up in that LDS culture, you were my Michael W. Smith. Oh, <laughs> that is a compliment. Yeah, he's, uh, and I've been able to run into him a couple times. And yeah, both of you exhibit this humility that mm -hmm. I admire. And no matter what the situation is, I know from personal experience, you you go to the call. If, you, if you've been called to do something, you go and do it. Yeah. It's like when I remember I was uh, recovering from a heart transplant and we'd never met. I know. <laughs> and I'm Ugh. like, I'm cold calling you because in that moment where I had survived, I wanted the musician that had the biggest impact on me to come to the hospital and experience the miracle. Hmm. And you came and you, you didn't just play a couple songs, like you did a whole set list. <laughs> well, you're in the hospital, like you need something for to pass the time, right? Yeah, but <laughs> it, you know, it's a memory I'll, I'll never forget. And it taught me as an artist, the importance to focus on the one, mm. to really minister to the one. Mm. So well, it, was, it was my honor and privilege to be there that day for you, Paul. Broken souls that need his mending, broken hearts for offering. I believe that God loves broken things. And yet our broken faith, our broken promises sent love to the cross. And still that broken flesh, that broken heart of His Offers us such grace and mercy Covers us with love undeserving This broken soul that cries for mending this broken heart for offering I'm convinced that God loves broken me Praise His name, my God loves broken things So thank yeah. you. Well, I, I thank you. Well, I want to first introduce people, if you're unfamiliar with Kenneth Cope, you got to go ask Alexa or Siri to play his music. And I, I want to dive back first okay. when you first got started, because this project we're going to talk about, Son of Man, it's one of the most ambitious and you've been working on it for 25 years. And Long, so yeah. let's go, let's go back to the beginning when it was like the eighties. Okay. <laughs> Did you think you were going to be an artist? Did you, is that something you wanted to do? Paul, when I was really young, probably nine, um, <clears throat> I have three brothers and we're all one year apart. I'm the third of the four boys. Yeah. And the Jackson Five was huge when I was a little nine-year-old boy. And I just loved to sing. And I can remember listening to their, their records. I mean, think of Michael was probably 10 at the time and they were just killing it. And I just loved it. I was living in the South. It was living down in Florida. And I knew I loved music. And then one day my mother and I are in the car, we're driving down the road and I'm singing to the radio and I'm making up harmonies that aren't in the song. I'm just making up harmonies, you know? And my mother's listening 
she pulls up to a stoplight and she looks back at me and she says, son, you have a gift. Mm. And, uh, that's the first time I ever thought about like what it meant to be a, an artist or a musician or whatever. And so I just continued to perform and sing. I never, I didn't even write until I was probably in my very early twenties. Mm. And I think it was a girl that got me to write my first song. You know what I mean? <laughs> Isn't it always? <laughs> Isn't it always, you know? Yeah. But before then, I was just singing all the time. I went to a high school for the performing and visual arts in Houston when I lived there mm. and had a lot of great experiences with some really amazing vocalists and musicians, was in bands, uh, just loved music. Why, and were then, you why were you moving around? Yeah, my father worked for the National Weather Service, and he okay. kept taking these job opportunities that would move his pay grade up just a little more okay. and a little more and a little more. So... Most of my growing up was in Houston, mm -hmm. and uh, I was at that school for the arts. And I, I remember hearing some music. I was probably about 16, 15 or 16, hearing some music where it wasn't Amy Grant yet. It was someone else, and they were singing a song about light and Jesus and goodness. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. really started to resonate with me, and I thought, wait a second, you can make music like this what and it just put planted a seed in me yeah and and that's kind of it's grown to become an you know an artist so that's kind of how it all started it happened a lot of young people like you want to get into rock and roll and be like a rock and roll star and i know you have great great artists that you look up to but what was it about doing christian music what why why that direction and and i did you know like like you and me growing up we we i played in bands that played rock and roll and did dances and performances but when i connected with spiritual music it was way more fulfilling like i felt inside of me there was a sense of wholeness mm -hmm. light i just wanted to i don't know it felt way more fulfilling to me than to just do a great cover of somebody's song you know Hmm. Yeah. I wonder who that artist was, that first artist that you heard. Yeah, I think it was his name. I think his name was Denny Crockett. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I went to a retreat with several of the band members of Mercy Me. Oh, yeah. And um, Bart Millard, who's the lead singer that, you know, wrote I Can Only Imagine. And then it was Amy Grant that she was supposed to that was going to be on one of her records, but she gave it to Bart. Yeah. And he was relatively unknown. So we're at this retreat and, you know, I, I come from the same culture you do. So I don't know a lot of that early music. I didn't realize because he put on playlist after playlist of songs from the seventies and eighties because so many of my Christian friends were not allowed to listen to rock and roll. They were only allowed to listen to the newsboys and some of these earlier groups. And I find that fascinating. But in your upbringing, did it matter? Did you, were your parents concerned at all of, of the type of music you were listening to? I don't think so. I mean, there was a time there. I don't know why, but I was, pro I was seventh grade. I can't even mm -hmm. remember. Kiss. The group <laughs> Kiss was huge. And I think that was the first time my parents kind of went, <laughs> because of all their makeup and stuff. Yeah, but it, it's so funny. It was so edgy at the time, but then when the uh, Olympics, the Winter Olympics, came to Salt Lake in two thousand two, yeah, and Kiss performed at the closing ceremonies, <laughs> and my <laughs> wife and I are sitting next to each other, looking at each other, going like, "This is the most tame music that's on the stage tonight." Isn't it's, that interesting? Yeah, it was so interesting how music evolves and what we think is edgy, yeah, and and breaking through. We look back and. You know, the, my dad's a Kingston Trio fan, so back in the day, they were probably a little <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Wow. So w when did you write your first song? So that first love song was probably in 84. With the girl. And, and for the girl. And then I, I tried, I wrote a little song about my dad, about fathers, you know, uh -huh. and then, and then um, I was working with some youth at a youth retreat kind of thing, especially for youth. And they, I, I knew that they had a theme and I thought maybe I could write a theme song. And so, yeah. yeah. So I pitched it to them and, and they thought, dang, dude, that's pretty awesome. 
And yeah. then they, I raised a little money. We recorded it and they were really excited then. And the director said, man, let's make some cassettes available for the kids for a couple bucks. We could just kind of that way, if they want a memory, a musical memory of the, of the events, they can ha take it home. And that's kind of what started, man. That's kind of started it all for me. Yeah. Take it home. What a catchphrase for EFY. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the popular song. I think Vicky Panky wrote that, the uh, Taking It Home With Me. Yeah, I think it was her. Yeah. Uh, EFY, you know, EFY is, you were a counselor. Yeah. I was a counselor. Awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, for three. It was one of the greatest experiences to be able to get all these youth from all over the United States on all these campuses. Yeah. And uh, just have fun with them, teach them about jesus christ yeah and uh do service yep and then we'd have performances <laughs> um they didn't last doing performances because they didn't want the focus right <laughs> there's a strange thing in the culture where they don't want focus on the artists right a and and uh you know um i had peter breinholt on the podcast and yeah. we've been doing through our lens and it's not absolutely correct but the best we know the the history of Mormon music and LDS culture. Mm. And so, you know, you were a big topic of that. And we went into the whole EFY era, how, you know, you're the one that kind of got that going, got the cassettes going. And, and then your voice, you know, we talked about how your voice started showing up on all these home front ads. <laughs> you remember that? Oh man. So many things have happened over the years so many things just nice things that god puts in your path yeah that you're able to do that might have an impact on somebody and i'm just grateful for all of it if it's been for good when did you meet lex de azevedo who was very involved with the osmonds in the 70s and 80s because he's the one that signed you right to embryo records and uh you know after this i'm actually interviewing julie oh good <laughs> Julie de Azevedo Hanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but when was the first time that you met Lex and do you remember his vision or anything he was saying about that? Yeah, he was, this was probably 80, 86. Mm -hmm. I had just done that first, especially for youth song project. Okay. And Lex's daughter, Emily, not Julie, but Emily was at that San Diego State University EFY, especially for youth program. Mm -hmm. And she went home and her dad had been saying around the house, I want to start a, a young label, like a youth label for the, these Mormon kids. You know, I want to, yeah. I want to figure out, I got to find some artists. She came <laughs> home from that and said, dad, I think I found one of your guys. Wow. And then he moved from North Hollywood. He moved up to salt lake city within months because yeah. that they're plan they were planning on bringing the music up here and my roommate randy karchner who i'd been pro producing and working with right randy was doing some arrangements for lex and lex said you, i i need mm -hmm. some singers for this project i'm gonna do and he goes well my roommate sings and told him my <laughs> name and lex goes that sounds familiar anyway so i sent him a couple of demos and he had me come up and sing on his thing and then he said hey do you write do you write any songs? And I played for him a couple of songs I had just written because I was now I was really getting into the writing thing. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, "Hey, man, would would you like to be my first artist on my label for these wow. young kids?" So that's kind of how it started. That's cool. Randy Randy Karchner was one of the first person I, I I met with when I came to Nashville eight years ago, and yeah, he told me about the days you guys were together, and he's a writer producer out here and yeah he's uh been doing quite a few things so that's that's funny it's a small world it is a small world for sure and with lex uh and embryo records you gave us um it was one album and then you gave us greater than us all right which was kind of a this is a classic landmark record mm. that i think it, worldwide success people all over the world gravitated to this one of the songs um, that was so touching for me is uh, "Never a Better Hero." Mm. This is kind of your, this is kind of your big hit. It's the one that started it. It really mm -hmm. is. I had done it for, especially for youth, the previous year, because mm -hmm. the the theme for that year was "Win the Race," oh, yeah. and so it was kind of this Olympic thing, you know. Yeah. And I had heard a young man at one of these youth retreats when we were talking about christ he stood up and said jesus is my hero <laughs> and i really liked that 
because a hero is not just a guy that you have a picture of on your wall because he's got a great batting average, right. but he's someone you want to be like. But then also a hero is somebody that at the risk of their own safety hmm. goes into darkness and terror to rescue you. Hmm. And so Jesus just felt like he fit the bill, you know? <laughs> and so I wrote that song for that project. And then Lex said to me after he heard it, he said, man, I would like to see a whole album written about Jesus like that. And wow. so I jumped into Greater Than Us All, and that's what happened. Yeah, it tells, it tells a beautiful story. And I would say it's kind of a preliminary years ago to what you're doing now. But before we get to this, uh, you did another project, which was ambitious, and you put it on stage, and this was called My Servant Joseph. And as when I was a, a Mormon missionary, I have to tell you, the theology that I learned about, you know, the narrative was through your, mm. was through your recording. And I guess my big question for a lot of people, I think within the Mormon church and outside the Mormon church, um, since it's been, you know, scrutinized and Richard Bushman of Columbia, you know, emeritus historian has said that the narrative of of what Joseph Smith experienced in the Sacred Grove and many of the things he did it should be questioned because the narrative is somewhat misleading and they, they need to figure out how to give a more accurate narrative of what happened. If you were to do My Servant Joseph again, would you do anything, not, not artistically, mm. but doctrinally, uh, would you do anything different? Um, I know more now than I did, and I'm a better writer now than I was. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, a lot of time's gone by, but I still, I still have the same passionate connection with Joseph that I did then. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just probably delve in deeper to some of the things that he experienced and shared. Yeah, um, I'm not afraid in any way of uh, a facing joseph head on just because of the experiences i've had so and you would say that's by the by the by the spirit by yeah. okay. okay by the voice of jesus christ to me okay yeah. okay i love that i love yeah. that you're passionate about that and yeah that album man there's so many great songs mm. um brothers was one brothers of my favorite that's that's really one of my favorite brothers yeah. and free free at last yeah free at last and uh go with me yeah oh my gosh go with me it's such an <laughs> epic it's 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 kind of like uh it's kind of like i don't want to compare it too much but it's like when john denver wrote the eagle and the hawk just how it sends and it <laughs> uh -huh. sends uh -huh. it gets so powerful you literally are are taking people into the presence of god yep. through the music which was just so transcending so so yeah so that that kind of leads us to this oh man and i got the album a couple of years ago um part one mm. of the son of man and it's this thing tell us tell us about the son of man this project you've been working on forever okay so you know i did greater than us all about jesus jesus um just kind of us looking at his life maybe from mm -hmm. this time period and then maybe a little like this is a song in there with joseph and mary singing but but it's mostly from us looking at his life from here, from now. Come and see, take your place in that kingdom you've waited for. Trust in Messiah and gaze on the signs of belief. Come bask in the fire, lit by the Prince of God's peace. But I've, like I said, I've grown up. I've learned a lot more about him. I've become a lot more passionate about him. I was always passionate about him, but it's deeper and richer now. And so I started writing these songs back in the end of, uh, right before the turn of the millennium. Mm. And the songs were not from us looking back at Christ. They were from people in his life mm. looking at Christ and mm. even Christ himself telling his story. And the more I did that, the more I worked on these songs, the more it felt like this needs to be a musical. It needs to be yeah. on the stage. Hmm. It needs to be something. And I, and you know, Les Mis is the thing I can closest relate it to because it's all sung. It's done in the musical theater genre, 
but it's opera in not in that you know in the way it's sung but it's opera in that it's all sung there's no spoken dialogue mm -hmm. and um and i tried to do it in such a way where it just really quickly moves from baby young man you know it's where it just really moves through the story but it's Jesus is so important to me. I'm just filled up with so much love for him and such a desire to. I'm a preacher, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a preacher, and music mm -hmm. is my instrument, you know, to do that. And I just love to preach about Christ. And so this really is um, it is ambitious. It's cost a ton of money. Sure. But here we are, two and a half decades later, and it's finished. So it's it's unbelievable and i can't wait for everybody to, to to hear it if they haven't already heard it did you have you finished part two yeah part two i mean like you have the book right i, right. I sent yeah. you the book yeah it's amazing and, and if you if you go on the right on the inside of the book right after the preface there's a page there that's got a qr code okay and with that qr code it takes you right to the um download of son of man musical.com Okay. where you get the music. If you own the book, you get the music. The music comes with it. Oh, that's smart. And so that's your way to then download it onto your, you know, electronic devices. Yeah. And enjoy the music. The book, the reason the book is so important, I feel, I can't get it on the stage yet. It's going to take some money. Yeah. It's going to take some people with vision. Mm -hmm. But but this is a way for the audience to not just listen to the the music, the songs, Mm -hmm. but to their lyrics and scene descriptions and visual images to allow the audience in their mind, because our imaginations are probably more powerful than anybody could create on this, on a visual screen or a stage. Our imaginations are amazing. And so if you have the book in front of you and you're listening to the music and you're reading what's happening on the stage and Jesus now walks over and looks out the window over the city, then he steps back and sits down with his disciples and, and you're taken through the show in your mind. Right. I think you'll have a rich, that's why the book was created to help someone have a rich, powerful experience before we could get it on the stage. Well, there's, I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, um, if you're listening, you got to pop over to YouTube because I'm going to show you some of these images. This, you got Mary, who, who, and these are almost images of real, there are images of real people performing, acting as, as Mary. Who did all this photography and artwork? Yeah. So, so about five years ago, I wanted to have resources to be able to do some kind of a marketing yeah. campaign, right? So I hired all of these actors. I got a, a casting director or two to help me find some people. I had already mm -hmm. found some others through some searching. And then I, I hired Russ Dixon, who's just this fantastic oh. photographer. And he brought his lighting guy, Ron Adair. And we had a, a woman named Ifer Mitchell who makes authentic costumes. Wow. We found the fabrics, she created them and then soaked them in tea and all kinds of stuff. So they looked like they were old and used yeah. and worn. And then we brought in a couple of really great Lindy Crow and Ed Matsu to do the uh, makeup. And uh, heck, I even had a friend in the neighborhood <laughs> who has an RV and I asked them if they would be the RV thing where the guys could change their clothes and stuff like that, you know? And so we just kind of, and then we had 35 actors and we just yeah. found some places around here and did it. All right. Page 162 for my friend, Sam Payne, his dad. Yeah. Marvin right here as Joseph of Arimathea. Actually, he's Nicodemus. Oh, is he Nicodemus? Nicodemus, okay. yeah. He looks amazing. Yeah, he does. He's aged perfectly into that role. Like he, he just is so. And uh, he, yeah, and he he's one of the two, is it two or three singers? Okay. That are act, that are actors as well. So Nicodemus, he's Nicodemus in the book in the pictures, and he's also Nicodemus vocally on the recording. Yeah, man. So you know, there's a lot of. Um, organizations that have tried to do these incredible productions that have done these incredible productions. You know, you have Andrew Lloyd Webber's, uh, a little more rock and roll. Um, this is more sacred. Um, you've got a couple other stage productions of, of Christ's life. Why, why is this, why do you think this is so unique? 
uh, and I don't know Andrew Lloyd Webber. I've never met him. So I don't know what his feeling is about <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, but I don't get the feeling necessarily from what I've heard from the show that he's a staunch believer. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know. But I know that I am a staunch believer. And so I wanted to be sure to create something from the point of view of a believer. Yeah. And it says that kind of in the preface. Jesus Christ's story is astonishing. It's like it, you couldn't write a more incredible story than Jesus right. Christ's story. And for those of us that believe that it's true, it's even more astonishing, you know? So, so I really want to do that. And again, like I said, Paul, my passion for Christ, it's just, it's just what I was put on the earth to do, man. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. You know, the story of Christ, you have four gospels, okay. Four, four witness books. Right. And of those four, they disagree on details, but they all tell the same story. Right. And that is the best case yeah. for a historic Jesus. Right. And then you have all these witnesses. And, you know, you, throughout the, the, the musical, there are so many stories of people that have been healed. Yeah. And uh, let's talk for a minute about your understanding of how Christ redeems, how he heals. Um, there's this concept within, and I'm trying to help my 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 friends understand the mormon culture better right so they can appreciate their friends their family because there's so many misconceptions sure. and misunderstandings and obviously you know that the the key doctrine is is the trinity and the idea of how jesus saves right. there's this there's this concept that we continue to hear within the lds culture is that if i repent i will be forgiven versus a Christian who says, I am forgiven, but I need to repent so I can forgive myself. Mm. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. Interesting. Have you For me, concept? no, no, no. For me, the concept is I repent and I am forgiven. Okay. And I will repent again tomorrow because I want to continue to be forgiven. I want to live a life, a penitent, humble life before the Lord, but a life of hope that he continues to save me. He continues to redeem me. He continues to forgive me and continues to grow me. That's his whole, I think God is a God of growth. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a God of growth. And I just feel that when I spend time in their presence, mm -hmm. I feel myself growing. So is it the love of Jesus that empowers you to want to be a better person or is it, or does he make you a better person? Both. Okay. He gives me that. I've said this before. People have said, I feel the love of God in the, or feel that God is loving me and it makes me so feel so good. I feel closest to, to God and to Jesus mm -hmm. when they give me love for mm -hmm. them. When I feel love for them, that's yeah. when I feel the closest to them. And there are times in my life when it's, it's really strong. And I'm just like, Oh, I, I just want to serve you, you know, and I feel like I can't create that. I know it's a gift to be yeah. given that love for them. And so that's what propels me is to feel that love from them for them. It makes me want to be a better person. It makes me want to be like Jesus. Yeah. I love that. When you were a bishop, which yeah. is, you know, there's no paid ministry within the LDS culture. And so you're writing songs, you're probably doing other things for income. And uh, you get asked to be a bishop. Now, you have a reputation uh, of, of a bishop that, I mean, you, not all bishops, you, this was like, you were all in. And people notice, like, Kenneth is like, Bishop, Bishop Cope here, he's a little... He's just totally all in. We're not used to this love. <laughs> well, um, it's really interesting because uh, the idea of a bishop to me was always this guy that was really connected, this guy that was really good, 
this guy that was always serving everybody. And I, I don't, I don't think I ever felt like that guy. I, in fact, I would introduce myself to my parent parishioners as sinner bishop, <laughs> because you know who are we kidding? You know, like I don't want anybody to think more of me than I yeah. know. I know yeah. myself better than anybody knows myself, yeah. and so, and if I could be a voice of hope for people, and a voice of love, and a voice of like a, from Christ's love. Mm -hmm. Then, then I would be. Then that would be successful as a bishop. Yeah, yeah. All of this sounds really optimistic and exciting. Uh, you know, people catch that fire. But what is something you really struggle with that's been a been a thorn in your life? Oh uh, wow! I I hate to. I hate to confess sins <laughs> on, the, on YouTube. No, we won't. We won't do it on YouTube. So you, you, you can. <laughs> um, I so, know we all we all have a secret. We all have things that we're dealing with. But uh, I don't know. Maybe the, I don't want to set it up. But you know, go yeah, yeah, yeah. My my struggle is uh, lots of time. I feel like imposter syndrome. Mm. Because I, I think that we think if people have spiritual gifts, mm -hmm. and I know that the Lord's given me spiritual gifts, especially when it comes to music, spiritual music, I think people assume that they've got it all going on or that everything's good or that they're so tight all the time with the Lord and angels are coming <laughs> in their bedroom in the morning. And you know what I mean? I think we make these kind of assumptions when people have really beautiful spiritual gifts. Yeah. But I think the spiritual gifts are given so that we, all of us in our brokenness can add to the family, to the body of Christ and all of us can participate in helping each other. And yeah. so I, f I struggle with imposter syndrome, probably. Yeah. Um, I want to be like Jesus, and I'm just not. And people say, Kenneth, you're Christ-like. And I, I like in my heart go like, you just don't know me, you know? Yeah. But I know I want to be like him. So if God gave me that, if God gave me that desire, then at least I have that from him, you know? Where does grace come in with it's that? All, it's all the way through it. Yeah. Like grace isn't just to help us when it's not going well or grace is all the way through it for me. Like if something goes great, if something doesn't go great, God mm -hmm. is with me, helping me. He'll help me get up again. He'll help me take whatever did go well with receive it with humility and grace Mm -hmm. And it's just, I, I think the grace is such a beautiful, it, for me, it means this gift of strength, this gift of, it's not, we talk about in the Latter-day Saint culture that it's an enabling power. I think it's more than that. I think mm -hmm. it's an ennobling power. Mm. I think it's, I think it's in uh, this power that's just always with us because I think we, I think a lot of things might be, ha could happen to us that are kept from happiness happening to us mm -hmm. because of the grace of God that we don't even know to thank him for, you know? Hmm. You grew up in Florida and then Houston. So you were, you were not necessarily within, I would, you know, you say the Bible belt, but I would say the Mormon belt of Utah and Idaho. Um, you were not there until later. So you had friends that were not of your faith, that were um, Christian. Right. Uh, I say that in quotes, Christian. And um, do you think that's helped you have a greater understanding of Christ or appreciation? Yeah, I think everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Like no, no two Christians are the same. Mm -hmm. Like this Christian feels a little differently about God than that mm -hmm. Christian does or a little differently about how Christ assists and helps them through the journey of life than this Christian does. And so I think that just meeting other people in their faith tradition and what they feel important about as far as God, Jesus Christ, or, or whatever, that it's all expansive, that it's all growing, that it's all good because like just me and you, you and I are so different. Mm 
Yeah. But we're so but we're so similar in our passion for Jesus. And so I can learn things from you. I want yeah. to learn things from you and I want to experience your walk. You know what I mean? Like I think that's Beautiful. all so important. And if Fellowship. any of it, yeah, and if any of us get into this like I'm going to stay over here in this box, mm -hmm. then we're missing it. We're missing life. Okay. We're missing a richer, fuller understanding about Christ. I have read C.S. Lewis books, uh, Philip Yancey books, um, all these beautiful Christian writers mm -hmm. that that look at Christ from another angle. And that's kind of how I've always wanted to make my music was to see Jesus from all these different spotlights, from all these different corners. So I am blessed to be able to know anybody that will share their their faith with me. And and I don't know, I just I just love it that we're all so different. You know, why do you think, why do you think some Christians have a hard time with some of the things that, uh, Mormons believe? Why do you think they struggle with it? Some of it is probably because they don't talk to their, they don't have a friend that's a Latter-day Saint that they can talk to about it mm -hmm. and, and talk to about it in an open, friendly, like interested dialogue Yeah. instead of this kind of dialogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? You know what I mean? Like if, if, and, and there are obvious, obvious, uh, religious differences, doctrinal differences, right. Yeah. That, that are core differences. But I, even that, I mean, like I, I'm not a Jew, Yeah. but I love being with Jewish people that, that are like, into their religion and love God and see him in their life mm. in the world around them mm. and in and their faith walk it's all beneficial and um i believe in a jesus christ that wants to save as many of us as he can i believe in it if he created us and i believe he did mm -hmm. i believe he wants to save as many of us as will come to him and so I am not going to help anybody come to him by putting up a wall. Yeah. And we will be right back. Did you know the best way to support your favorite musician is to bypass social media and go to their website and subscribe to their mailing list? Pianist Paul Cardall had his Facebook hacked by a dark web third-party marketing company in Vietnam because of hackers on a third-party platform vulnerable to malware. Paul lost communication with over 165,000 of his followers. Some of those people are you. It took five months and $10,000 to recover his Facebook page. Please show your support, particularly for our host. Go to Paul's website and subscribe, followed by other artists you enjoy. Visit www.paulcardall.com. Do you yeah. pray to Jesus Christ or do you pray to his father i pray to the father in his name when i'm praying formally mm -hmm. but there are times when i call out to him mm. he's talked to me i sing praises to him i pray to him when i sing mm. you know i need thee every hour oh help me now my savior mm. i come i mean i i pray to him so much when i sing all about you all about you for me lord it's all about you um i, I would say i'm praying to them both both of them yeah. doctrinally it's kind of a interest we pray to the father in the name of jesus because it looks like he said that in the scriptures but he's there right next to him hearing it all and he's called himself god throughout every one of the scriptures mm. and so i think he's just right there and i think he's he's the god of my salvation you know yeah but for me lord it's all about you you're the reason i do what i do because for me lord it's all about you you're the reason i do what i do yeah for me lord it's all about you. and you have a pretty good knowledge and study of the yeah. bible pretty good yeah how, how so how then does the book of mormon um impact your journey with jesus and songwriting the book of mormon is so clear hmm. it's so clear 
it calls Jesus God over and over and over again. Jesus says, I am the Lord your God. He is the God of the land. Jesus Christ is the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth. I mean, like, so I, it, it, the Book of Mormon has strengthened, if it strengthened my desire to know Jesus more because it's so clear yeah. in the way it's said, in the way it's in, in the English. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. So I love it. I love it the way it leads me to Christ. Yeah, it's such a it it's such a mind blowing concept that in our time there would be some some there would be a faith that says we have new scripture. The last time that happened <laughs> yeah. was, was back in like the the eighth century when the Quran came after Muhammad. I've read the Quran. Mm. And it's this beautiful book of lamentations. Mm, interesting. Really. Yeah. They're they're crying out basically saying, "Look, God gave Abraham a covenant and the Jews, and this is what the Quran says, so this is not my feeling, and the Jews have taken that and abused it, have not kept the covenant." Mm. And then the covenant comes and is reminded by the prophet Jesus. And what do the Christians do? They invade our lands in his name. They kill our women and our children and they conquer by the sword. So they are in the Quran, they're saying both of these that have been one given the covenant and through Jesus, the Christian uh, prophet propels the covenant, teaches the covenant, they've all failed. Mm. And so, and so it's pretty much here we are, the revelations have come through Muhammad and we're not going to mess up this time. And we are elected, we are called, we are chosen. Now this is the same idea among Latter-day Saints. We are called, we are elected, we are chosen. The called and chosen thing, this is the way I see it. If I am called, it's by Jesus to come to him and follow him and to walk his walk. If I am chosen, it's because it's for the purpose of helping others find him. It's not that I'm special and you're not special. Do you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. when I see those words or think of those words, elected, to be elected, it's, that's a scriptural term that we don't even really use in the normal vernacular, but to be elected or the elect it, I think it's this responsibility like the birthright son that was had two portions given to him so that he could take care of the widow when she, when the husband died and he could take care of the sisters if they didn't get married and have a dowry. Like it was his responsibility to take care of the family. So for me, called, chosen, and elected is not, you get to go to heaven. You get a free ticket. Okay. It's you've got to take care of these people. This okay. is your responsibility. I, Jesus Christ, I'm revealing myself to you, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. And now you are called to help others be, so I can be reveal. I can reveal myself to them. Blessed are the humble who come unto me, the meek of the earth, those hearts that are pure. Blessed are you, merciful, and you who make peace, who hunger for God and His Word. I give you to be the salt of the earth the light of the world, the leaven of men. Do this and I'll bless you with treasures in heaven. These are the words of life. Give heed to the words of life. Well, I feel like I'm talking to one of my Christian buddies. At <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it honestly, it's kind of an unusual conversation, but I've always seen that in your music because there's a couple artists that I, I, I turn to when I want to hear songs, which are like Psalms with theology, you, 
There's an artist named Andrew Peterson. Yeah, Andrew Peterson. I've never met him, but he's so talented. Unbelievable. Great writer. He gave a great sermon at Oxford, uh, you know, and he's not even, never went to Oxford, never went to Harvard, but he's so eloquent in what he has to say. He was invited to speak and he talks about the poets and the prophets mm. and how poets are often ridiculed for their passionate feelings. Mm. And they tend to, to shout through their music, through their art, through everything, what is being felt by the people. Yes. And then you have a prophet who is leading, has vision, and is, is you know, prophesying. You know, it's the story of King David who <clears throat> Saul's the king and yeah. he's stressed out. So what does he do? He calls David to his uh, chamber to play the harp. Play music, yeah. <laughs> to play music. And so have you always, do you feel in some way that you, you've you combined both, that you're a poet, but you're also prophetic in what you're doing? Uh, if I am prophetic in any way, it's in my testimony of Jesus. Okay. I don't necessarily have the, the gift of prophecy outside of that to like look into the future. Yeah. But but the scriptures, the New Testament says the you know the gift of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So I definitely have that and have been given that from God, from yeah. the Spirit. I know it. You know, um, I do feel like see a poet or prophet. Let's see. When I feel like distance between me and Jesus, mm -hmm. me and the Father, me and the Spirit, when I feel distance, mm -hmm. and for whatever those reasons may be, just really busy, I haven't immersed myself in the scriptures enough lately, or whatever it is, when I feel that distance, and I know that I have a gig coming up to sing, right? So I start yeah. singing, I start singing songs, uh, you know, for an hour a day for a few days before the show, just to keep my voice warm and the muscles, you know, strong and whatever. Yeah. I feel my spirit lift as mm. I sing. Cause mm. those songs, those songs represent my feelings. And so it's really cool to, to have the music lift me just in, I don't know what, you know what I'm saying? Like it prepares me spiritually, yeah. not yeah. just vocally, yeah. But it prepares me spiritually for that performance that's coming up. Well, when I go to, you know, when I go and do presentations, performances, uh, what was used to call, be called firesides, which right. is a gathering of people yeah. uh, around a fireplace, but it's a gathering of people around the church to hear music, to hear something. Um, I would listen to certain types of music. Yeah. And I have to admit, though, the best uh, experience I have performing is when, cause I do such mellow. So if I listen to Rush's 2112, <laughs> there's some cool music in there, bro. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I'm with you. I feel bad for my Christian friends that never got to, <laughs> to hear really it, <laughs> get baptized and all the really good stuff. So maybe that's the theological difference. That's so but, funny. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. So, Kenneth, is your is Son of Man going to be able to be streamed? Is it? Do you have distri digital distribution for the streaming? I haven't. I haven't put it in place yet. I've totally got access to it. I've totally paid for okay. it and everything. I'm kind of waiting because I want the book. I want the book to get out first. Okay. And because the music comes with the book, you can download it, right? So yeah. But the book itself is. This is my. I put a thing in every side of every book. It's an invitation. And the invitation says, if you'll, if you were going to go see Les Mis or any other musical that you wanted to see, you'd set aside three hours one night, you'd drive to the theater, you'd park your car, you'd go inside, you'd sit, you'd wait, you'd turn off your phone, and mm -hmm. then you'd let that experience happen to you. And so I am inviting the person that that is interested in checking out Son of Man to have that experience with Son of Man without having to leave your home. Put the put the music on. You get you get it with the book. And then yeah. go through the book as you're listening and just take that three hours to have this experience on a Friday night with your yeah. belo beloved or whatever, and go through it and see if the Spirit of Christ doesn't descend upon you in power. I just don't think that we can spend 
that much time thinking about him and not have his spirit descend upon oh, us. Yeah. And and so that's been my experience. I, I, as you can imagine, Paul, and you understand this, when you make recording, you listen to passages a thousand times to make sure that it feels like it has the right, that instrument's a little loud there. Let's bring it back a little bit. You listen to that same passage again. Let's bring this up right here now. And you listen to that passage again over and over and over again. I've heard this music. I've been working on it for 24 years, right? So I've heard this music over and over again. But when I sit down with this book and I just let myself be taken away by the story, by the arc of Jesus' story mm -hmm. and the music and the look at the words, I I have the experience myself. Jesus' spirit descends upon me. It's powerful. So I would love for the listener, the public, to be able to have that experience at least once, which is why it's created that way. Yeah. Oh, if it's okay, I'm going to put in some snippets yeah maybe 15 second snippets master nicodemus of the pharisees wants to speak with you we know you are a teacher come from god no man could do these miracles if god weren't with him no man can see God's kingdom except he be born again. Can you briefly sing the, there's only, there's one, two, three, four, five, six lines in I Have Come for Love. Oh, yeah. Just, just by myself vocally here? Yeah, I know. Listen, folks, you, it's still the studio work, but just the no, the no, raw, I'm not just the, <coughs> the rawness, rawness of, of it would be really cool for people to yeah to hear because you know you're you you're the voice of Jesus on the cassette on the here I go cassette <laughs> <laughs> CD eight track uh, digital download streaming what have you but, whatever uh, yeah we're old um, <laughs> which so, which six lines. So again, he leads them slowly. Uh, uh, again, he leads them to slowly walk with him. So he, right we there. imagine the apostles are with him and they're complaining about what he said or whatever, <laughs> trying to figure things out, what's going on, what's happening here. And he slows things down. Yeah. And what's just happened is he was in the house of Simon the Pharisee. Mm. This woman comes in. He's in the house of Simon the Pharisee for dinner. This woman comes in and just throws herself at his feet crying and gets gets his feet all wet, then pulls out this beautiful ointment and puts it on his feet and then wipes his feet with her hair. And Jesus knows that Simon says, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is that touches him. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus straightens Simon out, leaves with the woman, and then turns the woman over to Mary and the other women disciples that are part of the group. And then he tells his, his apostles, this is why I came for mm. this woman, for all of my father's children. And then he sings, I have come for love. I have come for love to ransom the prisoner to rescue the lost with beauty for ashes no matter the cost i have come Underscore, underscore, underscore. That's who he is. That's who he is. That's why he came. No matter the cost. No matter the cost. What a great, great, powerful line. There's this, you know, hope I have and belief I have that we underestimate. We truly underestimate how his atoning sacrifice, because of his love, no matter the cost, how far reaching it is in the vast cosmos. Mm. He created us. Yes. He went to the cross to redeem us, 
And he said, it is finished. Mm. And, and, and the days of the darkness are numbered. Mm. And there's this marvelous light that's going to come mm. and heal, you know, heal Israel, heal all these countries that are so divided, war, everything is just going to, you know, Andrew Peterson talks about the seed that you plant and him and his daughter, and this is the song, they would tend to it and mm. watch just this one little seed and it would grow and it would blossom, but it would die. But then again, it would come and it would mm. grow and just this amazing thing. So Kenneth, man, I just want to thank you for who you are, for being the man behind the message, mm. for being um, just a light to all of us. Mm. And um, everyone go to kennethcope.com. Is there a website for... Sonofmanmusical.com. Okay. Anything else you're thinking about or want to share? I just love you, Paul. I'm glad that we got to have this interaction, which has blessed me today. Again, two people that are see it a little differently, mm -hmm. but I'm lifted because you shared yourself with me today. All right, brother. Okay. So good All to right. be with you. Well, let's keep in touch. I would love it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Behold the Lamb of God. What shall we do, John? Behold the Lamb of God. What shall we do? What shall we do? Behold the Lamb of God without blemish who takes away The time has For more information, visit www.paulcardall.com.